manner reads, no language but power. Moreover, language has not been completely missing from the critique of the plain juridical model, which was condemned for restricting itself to saying no. And we have understood what power, uh, what Foucault means by this. In saying no to something, we say it, we name it, in an utterance, and uh, in an utterance, and this saying implants in us a desire we might not otherwise have had. Tell a child not to touch something hot, and the minute your back is turned, you can expect to hear a squeal of pain. Draw up a list of uh, thou shalt not ten, or however many choose, and you can be sure that they will become the chapter and verse of our transactions at every moment of our life. Interdiction is a kind of saying. But Foucault is now argu arguing that the obverse is also true. Affirmation through, uh, through putting into language, saying as such, is also a kind of interdiction. The only difference between the negative notion of power and this constitutive one is that the first encourages the false hope of liberation, while the second admits the truth outright. You are always already trapped. The history of sexuality indicts Lacan's linguistic return to Freud as a recreation of the founder's negative uh, repressive hypothesis and the reinstatement of a law of subjectivity. Language is what essentially dictates its law to sex, which means that sex is placed, I'm, I'm quoting Foucault, law, it, uh, language is what essentially dictates its law to sex, which means that law is placed by language in a binary system. Licit, illicit, language, uh, uh, licit, illicit. Language constitutes sex as a form of intelligibility and casts the pleasure of bodies into the realm, um, not simply of unintelligibility, but more into oblivion in existence. One must not talk about what is forbidden until it is annulled in reality. What is inexistent has no right to show itself, even in the order of speech, where its inexistence is declared. That's the no point. Um, mockingly, Foucault draws up seven commandments of, um, of uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. Thou shalt not go near, thou shalt not touch, thou shalt not consume, thou shalt not experience pleasure, thou shalt not speak, thou shalt not show thyself, thou shalt not accept, thou shalt not exist, except in darkness and secrecy. Lacan is guilty, then, of reinforcing or radicalizing Freudian negation by making it bear on existence itself. If to affirm is to make exist, not saying something amounts to denying it exists. The radicality of another kind of negation seems to beckon for attention, but Foucault ignores it. The unsayable is quickly folded back into the logic of prohibition. The result of this folding back is that the distinction between existence and inexistence is assimilated to the barrier between, uh, between the licit and the illicit and so on. That, forms, uh, that form the binaries of um, um, which law, including the law of, the, of language, dominates. Defining the barrier, law reigns over both sides of it. It is time to cease berating Foucault, both for his unapologetic conflation <coughs> of various forms of negation and for his characterization of language's resources as limited and limiting. Let us instead begin to respond to the charges by respond to the charges by demonstrating the ways in which psychoanalysis articulates a way out of the impasses into which theorizing power, law, and language have often led us. We will need to restart the discussion from the place where we first spied a fork in the road. Precisely in the Freudian assertion that some obstacle is necessary to heighten libido. Refusing to see the obstacle as a, a lure fabricated um, by the conflated entity repression, prohibition, censorship, Foucault constantly says, no difference, they're all the same, then, then how do we see it? 
I attempted elsewhere to cast Foucault's interpretation of the repressive hypothesis into doubt by citing the uh, Freudian distinction between the repression of ideas and the displacement of affect, but failed to develop my counterproposal very far. The context from which I took this distinction is significant. The per precise formulation I cited came not directly from Freud, but from an address by Lacan to students who were voicing discontent with their overly intellectualized, overly abstract university, university education, which in the face of global issues then unfolding seemed irrelevant. Lacan responded that that if he felt he was in a good position to answer these students' concern, it was because Freud had led the way when he was obliged in his day um, to answer similar complaints about the intellectualization of the analytic process on the one hand and the maintenance of, of the repressed on the other. Lacan states that Freud's response, which um, uh, supported itself directly on a, form, a formulation of the concept of negation, um, Verneinung, is what ultimately gave psychoanalysis the weight necessary to stand up to the misgivings concerning its consequentiality, that is, to um, its real world effectiveness. The reference to negation is what introduces and accounts for the distinction I mentioned a moment ago, um, although ideas can be repressed, or it is explicitly stated that affect is not repressed. Affect is effectively displaced, unidentified, broken off from the roots, it eludes us. Pivotal for the claim that the resources of language and psychoanalysis are robust and enable both, uh, both to intervene in the world, the concept of Verneinung will have to be spelled out. A couple of preliminary points will help flag and thus hold firmly in mind um, the stakes involved. One, that the absence of any mention of affect from Foucault's account of the Freudian theory of sexuality did not ignite the outrage of readers only confirms the message Lacan was attempting to get across. Those who were blinded by the, his emphasis on the linguistic dimension of psychoanalysis from, uh, uh, from perceiving any, any evidence of affect there were surely laboring under a distorted notion of affect as independent of language. For Freud and Lacan, on the other hand, affect is unapproachable except by a language. This means that the direct access to bodies and pleasures Foucault hoped to achieve could only remain a pre-critical pipe dream. By setting um, um, out, out to bypass language, one loses affect, which is cited in the body, um, um, which is cited in the body. Um, two, the impasse in which Foucault found himself makes plain the roadblocks we have, we have to clear. The pro problem well acknowledged was his um, inability to conceive an outside of power, even as he accused psychoanalysis of perpetrating this very crime by tethering every resistance to the short leash of law. In the juridical discursive model, power just is this tethering of outside to inside is the very, very uh, guarantee of their articulation. Every resistance remains under the jurisdiction of power. Opposing this model, Foucault sees no other way out than to deny power and insight. Since power, in its productive rather than negative capacity, is endlessly ramifying, without boundaries, we need not fear the prison doors of power closing around us. Yet any relief um, this assurance might bring will be short-lived, for it is also immediately apparent that without boundaries or doors, there are no exits for power. No way then to limit or radically alter the course of power. In the concept of Fernando, we are hoping to find a way of relating language and affect um, and an outside that does not revert back to power. 
To be fair, Foucault does admit that a more radical notion of negation than the prohibition, interdiction, and censorship variety he mainly deals with um, is, um, it is invoked in the Lacanian version of psychoanalysis, at least, uh, in the Lacanian version of psychoanalysis, at least. But he brushes off um, his claim to radic radicality without examining it. There are actually two more um, radical forms of negation that will concern us here, and they were introduced by Freud before Lacan was driven to um, uh, uncover them from ne neglect. First one is um, the, the foreclosure, and then the phenomenon of negation. We will deal primarily with the second, which is the subject of, of Freud's brilliant essay, Negation, a reading of Freud's essay. Neither of these is subject to the dynamic force of repression that um, enables the famous return of the repressed to consciousness. The negation is proper to um, uh, foreclosure and uh, negation bear not on a particular prohibit, prohibited act or object, but on being itself. If indeed this that is alluded to, it is badly caricatured in Foucault's claim that Lacan's constitutive notion of desire denies existence to particular acts or objects, denies is weak. Foucault intended to be. He prefers to underestimate the boldness of the Freudian hypothesis, which posits that there is from the very beginning a primal deduction, a radical expulsion of being by language. Some, something is expunged from psychic life. Psychic life does not simply suffer this loss, it is founded on it. From here on out, nothing exists except against the supposed background of absence. From the moment she is born, the subject is denaturalized and, and objects no longer appear to her in their immediacy. This thesis is manifest in various ways in Freud, but we see it most clearly in his positing of one primary lost object, the mother, or das Ding, the thing, as Freud refers to it in the project um, for scientific psychology. The prohibition of incest operates in psychoanalysis at this level of irrecoverable loss. Prohibition is therefore unfortunate in terms of the argument Freud develops, for it invites um, confusion with its false friend, prohibition.